He wrote a kind of a thank you letter to her publicly because he says no one signs up to be the first lady. Today on the show, critically acclaimed actress Penelope Ann Miller is here, and we're gonna be talking about her new film, Reagan. It's an education about our culture during those years mm -hmm. that people don't know about. In particular, we're looking at the political parallels from then and now. Even after she heard he was shot, she said, you know, if you don't take me there, I'm walking. But what's also more interesting are the things that are vastly different. If Kennedy can talk to Khrushchev and Reagan can talk to Gorbachev, somebody better start talking to somebody. Yeah. Let's get into it. Keeping it real with Jillian Michaels. I watched Reagan just last night, actually. Oh, wow. I got the link. Okay. Um, I watched it, and I could not wait to watch it, in large part because of everything going on mm -hmm. right now. And what's so crazy to me is the movie starts out, and you're just like, are we now or are we then? It's like Russia, Ukraine, and Cold War, and students are protesting. And like, attempted I, assassination. Yeah, I made a whole list. Starts with an assassination attempt, drama between Russia and Ukraine, struggles between the US and the Soviet Union, student protests, the National Guard. A debate debacle. Yeah, Russia infiltrates our society via the movies. Now it's like bot wars on social media. Given, Wild. Okay, so what were your thoughts when you got that script? Were you just start with playing Nancy Reagan, the movie, the era? What were you thinking? Well, I'd heard that they were making a movie about it and that, you know, that role hadn't been cast. And um, I don't even know if Dennis had been cast when I first heard about it. I heard Sean McNamara, the director, was attached, and he was somebody I'd worked with. You know, it was four years ago. So we made this movie four years ago. I said, we served, we served a whole White House term to get this movie out, like crazy. So times were different then, but we were also in the beginning of COVID. So that was already crazy in and of itself. Uh, we were one of the first, like maybe three movies that were actually filming in the beginning. So crazy. like that, it really came here like sort of in March and then we started in August. So we were kind of right out the gate, you know, filming. So there were so many crazy rules and protocols and stuff and we had to be tested every day. And we were shooting in Guthrie, Oklahoma and very isolated couldn't go out, couldn't socialize, like really, really insane. Like everybody was wearing a mask, so you didn't know what anyone looked like, except of course the actors, because we couldn't, we were in of hair and course, makeup. Of course, right. So, and you had bubbles, you had the A bubble and the B bubble and the C bubble, like, so people could only mingle with like, if you were in the A, like the director and the actors, and they, the B, you know, the makeup and hair, then there was a B, I mean, it was crazy. It was really dystopian. So we were dealing with all of that, I, and I, when you to go back to your to your question of what did I think or what did I feel oh, because when I, it's risky when it, it's well, political and because at the time I guess it wasn't as heated as it is now uh -huh. um, I kind of felt like oh what a cool like challenging interesting role to take on like people probably wouldn't think of me for that role um and I I I kind of thought like as an actor like it's fun for me to kind of surprise not only other people but myself and do what I don't know that I can do but I'm going to challenge and dive in and and see if I'm up to up to the task you crushed and it. so it also like thank you it's I also want to play different characters. Like, I don't want to be stereotyped and just be, you know, the leading lady or the girlfriend or the wife or whatever. I want to be an interesting character. So that gives me longevity. I mean, one of my first roles in a movie was Adventures in Babysitting. Of course. I my was kids love to, that movie to I auditioned day. for the Elizabeth Shue role, and they already had her in mind. And they said, well, she kind of looks similar to Elizabeth Shue. And I said, well, let me go in for the best friend. And I came back, I said, please let me audition for the best friend. And this is what's cool, cool about like being able to go into a room. So I, I greased my hair, I wore glasses, I wore like my dad's like oversized like sweatshirt or whatever. And I made myself sort of nerdy and, and I got the role to play her nerdy best friend and I, Brenda. And it was such a fun part, but I loved it because I love comedy, which I don't, feel like I get to do enough. And also it showed that I could be a character actress, which I thought maybe being an ingenue isn't 
that interesting. It's more fun to be a character, and it'll show that I that I can play diverse char- characters. Yeah. So then, with the Nancy Reagan of it all, yeah, I knew he's a conservative president. I mean, I grew up during the Reagan years, at eight years. So it's like. I remember that time, and I kind of liked the 80s. I liked growing up then. And I kind of was nostalgic about it, and I thought, well, there's so much I don't know. No one's done a movie about Ronald Reagan. And I really think everyone I just thought, like, this is a cool movie to make because it's history, and it's part of our culture, and it's part of our American landscape. And this is a story that hasn't been told. And there was so much to the story. I didn't know he had an alcoholic dad. I didn't know about the demise of his first marriage. And, you know, she was... Loss it was of the third child. The loss of the child. Um, FBI I didn't, informant? Did yeah, you know FBI, that? I, I didn't, didn't know that. No, FBI informant. Like, yeah. all FBI these informant. crazy things that... Also, I didn't even know their love story, which I thought was so incredible, was that love story between Nancy and Ron, Ronnie. And they were, oh my gosh, talk about... Like, they were like a power couple, but in love. Like, full-on, like, partnership beyond. And she was willing to give up everything. Whereas Jane Wyman wanted to be the superstar, want, you know, was getting an Academy Award and his career was going downhill and she didn't like it. She didn't like that he was getting into politics. Nancy was like, go do your, be you. Like go this, you know, this is your dream. If this is your passion or if this is your purpose, I will stand behind you and I will give it all up. I don't need the limelight. I don't need to be an actress. And it's kind of a beautiful thing because I think it can be considered submissive or stereo or she she was vilified a lot um and you know there's a lot of misogyny there and i see it now too to be honest but um where they're marginalized and they're put to side and if they're the woman's behind a man you know she's you know manipulative or conniving or controlling or whatever and nancy yeah through all the names in the book you know she and she 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 cried, she said, a lot of the eight years. She felt very isolated and 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 attacked and persecuted, and she didn't know why. And um, just hearing all of that, it was just like I wanted to humanize her, you know? I wanted her, because my image of her was kind of like this very austere. regal. So, austere, mm-hmm. exactly. Yes. She was fiercely protective. And obviously, as you were, had talked about the attempted assassination, that was like within two months of him taking office. Imagine the fear that that would install and in, in someone who's, you know, so madly in love with this man. In fact, and he said, you know, I would have lost my soul if, ha- if Nancy hadn't come into my life. And she, she is the, what propelled him to become, you know, he was already Screen Actors Guild president, Democrat for 40 years. Mm-hmm. Then he was governor of California, um, switched parties, and then, you know, obviously president. And then when he failed even at the beginning, you know, she's the one who said, I've had to share you my whole life, but I want you to be happy. That's what I signed up for. I want you to be happy. And um, and I just, I don't know, it was really beautiful to me and noble. And um, and I, so I, I felt bad for her, actually, more so than I expected to. And the people that I interviewed and talked to, like Sheila Tate, her press secretary, who also wrote a book um, called Lady in Red, which was really good. Nancy wrote a memoir, which was like my Bible. And that was called My Turn, where she really went into all of the things that had happened throughout, you know, their meeting, their, you know, all of the, you know, their their life together. And... Um, And their political years, of course, Um, and then him getting Alzheimer's, and it's it's it was so fascinating to me because I got the opportunity to see what life was like from her perspective, as opposed to outside looking in. I was inside, able to look out. So I was like, okay, this will guide me, you know. And in fact, I worked with the writers, the writer Howie um, Klausner was so amazing and so. I'm so grateful to him because he was so collaborative with me. Because I'd be like, no, she said it like this. This is what she said. It's in her book. You know, and he'd be like, okay, we'll say it like that. You know, I mean, I literally was like, this is what happened. This is what happened when, you know, where she said, even after the she heard he was uh, shot, you know, she, she said, you know, if you don't take me there, I'm walking. Like, and they put that line in. Or she was like, I'm like, he needs to see me. Even that line when she goes, in, he needs to know I'm here. 
even after he wakes up when she said, I should have been there. I, sh I always walk on your left side. I mean, it like chokes me up. And he's like, yeah, but then it would have been you. But she felt so protective of him and she felt like she should be with him and she needed to protect him and she needed to stand by him his side. And they were always just together. Yeah, together, always. always. Even, even if he was doing an interview, she would just be by his side and she'd sit and listen. There was, even when he was governor, like there's, I mean, I've seen doc, so many documentaries. She would be on the couch. There would be like a conference table and she'd be sitting there just watching, listening. She wasn't a political person. She was like taking it all in, absorbing, checking who out. I mean, she was the one who would say, you know, I like this person. I don't like that person. And sometimes he didn't follow her advice, but he did confide in her. And so a lot of the cabinet members would go, can you talk to Ronnie about, <laughs> like, will you talk to him? She's like, I'll try, you know, I'll do my best, you know, if she agreed or whatever. But, um, but very watchful, very, you know, just really checking everyone out. Cause she felt like, you know, there's even that scene on our first one where she's like, you're the one who's always, you know, the likable one, the one everyone loves that you want to believe in everybody's goodness. It's the, it's, I'm I'm here to protect you. I see. And they're out to get you to on get the plane you. when they were right. trying to impeach him. When she's like, you've got to stand up and yes. you've got to fight. Like, and she was that person. So I think it gave her that more of that sort of cold, austere kind of, um, you know, not not the warm and fuzzy type, but but when I spoke to people who worked with her, they were so incredibly loyal. They really respected her. They s remained friends. Those are all signs to me that she was, you know, a decent person. I have to say, the kids, I think, got shut out. I think the kids were hurt by that relationship. I mean, her daughter, Patty, said there were two halves of a circle and there was no room for us. Yeah, so it really was, their bond was kind of to the detriment of their children. And I think they did feel shut out. And um, and so, you know, it comes with a price, I guess, that kind of partnership and that kind of, I mean, even their house, the Reagan Ranch, which we shot in, which is like teeny. teeny. They were very modest people. Surprisingly. Oh, it was like a compound. No, no, no. Um, it is teeny. It's almost like, it's almost like, 700 or 800 square feet. It's tiny or maybe a little more than that, but it's t it was so small. Their bedroom is two twin beds together tied with like a zip tie. I'm not joking. It, 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 their living room, it's all in the movie. Their kitchen hasn't been touched. They're closed in their closet, but it's so modest. And he loved it. I think she would probably prefer to be elsewhere, but she know he loved it. He built every, <laughs> he built every like wood, the fence, you I know. she could have done with yeah, she, Even riding horses was like, okay, that's his passion. I'll ride too. You know, like even the funny thing where she sort of pretends she can ride when they first meet. But um, she was willing to go wherever he went and what made him happy made her happy. And so they had rich friends, but even when they lived in the Palisades, when before they were governor, I mean, his career was going downhill. I mean, you see in the movie, he's performing like vaudeville, like Vegas acts, and he's working for GE and all of that. I was gonna ask you about that because there, for me, there were two stories. You know, one of the political parallels, which are just kind of mind boggling that yeah. I wanted to ask you about, but. Then there's that personal story, which is so relatable. And I was trying to figure out how old he was when he's arguably washed up and he tells her, I've got no money. Right. I'm from a broken marriage. Right. I lost a kid. You know, it's yeah. like, I'm a mess. Yeah, well, I'm okay. basically That's a mess. That's sort of come on. Right, yeah. It's a, I, I'm a complete mess. And then she goes with him and he's doing that thing for Pabst and he's like, feels like a clown and you can see on your face yeah. that you're like, you're embarrassed for yeah. him. It's humiliating. And you yeah. were humiliated for him. Mm -hmm. But instead of, because there, I, I don't know about you, but I've had those moments where you're like, fuck man, does it, you know, where does it go from here? Like, how has it not gone where I thought it would go? Right. I wanted it to go here right. and now I'm doing this. Like, right. It was supposed to be that and right. now it's here. And I just, that, Oh my God, I felt that moment personally so intensely. And any other woman you would have thought yeah, would, would have out skipped out the back door. Yeah, I'm out. And she dug in and it was mm -hmm. so clear that she really picked him up and she said, did. you can do all these things you want to do. Mm -hmm. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. And and she sacrificed, like you said, so yeah. much for that. Yeah. Um, 
She he, gave him the strength and she gave him the courage and the confidence that he didn't have. He was really destroyed by his first marriage. He didn't believe he could find a marriage that that he would want that, that, that or someone he could trust or someone that would really believe in him or accept him for and we all want that we all want right. to just be loved unconditionally and accepted you know flaws and all good times bad times careers up career lows you want someone to just love us yes. right we all crave that and so I think when he met Nancy he, he didn't believe that he could have that but I think once he started to realize that's that's what she, he said. I would have lost my soul if Nancy hadn't come into my life. And his son even said at their memorial, his, her memorial, my, my dad would never have been president if it wasn't for my mom. I mean, they knew what she gave him. And I think she gave him a sense of, you know, I, c I can have somebody who's supporting me during this because that's hard to do on your own without like true support. And so I, I think she I did. I can't she, imagine she, anything she, harder. She, lift, she lifted him <sighs> and, and he wrote her a love note like almost every day. I mean, she has this book called that she published called I Love You, Ronnie. And it's all the love letters and the love notes because I think once he realized that this was true and it was real, he appreciated her so much that he wanted her to know it every day, every day. And that to me is so beautiful because people don't do that enough. You don't appreciate, you know, you end up picking each other apart Ugh. instead of going, oh my God, thank you. Thank you for being, you know, here for me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your, you know, your support and all those things. And in fact, even he was, he had a radio show that he did when he was president. And after the, um, the attempted assassination, he, he wrote a kind of a thank you letter to her publicly because he says, no one signs up to be the first lady. It's not a job you get elected into. It's not something that you go, yeah, I want to be this. And he knew that she was, she was, attacked a lot and that he's like, but she's been there for me and been by my side and she cares about our country and she cares about me. And I thank you, Nancy. Like it was public. And she said, she was just, she said, I'm glad it wasn't being folks. She goes, I just like tears streaming down my face. But who does that? You know, that a kind of appreciation. And it just, it made me appreciate him so much, like seeing that kind of side to him that you wouldn't see. And that's what's so cool about the movie, I think, for Reagan is that it's not just going to YouTube and watching his speeches, you know, tear down this wall, which is in the movie, but like, we can see that. Remember that though. Yeah, I do too. It's so wild. And when you see this, you guys tell the story about the speechwriters and yes. the one kid like, that- Like, is he gonna say it? Yeah. And that guy just spent days. I, I get chill, like, like yeah. thinking about it because I remember watching it. Yeah. And then, and then Dennis Quaid was there. He was, he, he and Meg Ryan went and got, actually chipped off a piece of the wall and they were there. Gosh. Yeah. You know, um, to, to go towards the, the political piece for a second, the, <laughs> the dysfunctional parallels are still alive and well, but a few things that he did, I don't personally feel we see, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong and you have a different opinion about yeah. it, but there's a moment where he's in the hospital and like a Democrat shows up. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, it's like, well, we're only enemies until six o'clock. Right. Then we're both men and... I feel like that's gone. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, and I was saying when I grew up, you know, my parents, um, you know, were liberal Democrats and they would go to parties um, that the Reagans were at because they knew the Bloomingdales and, and Betsy Bloomingdale was one of Nancy's best friends. And they would go to all these, you know, posh parties, whatever, Beverly Hills. And... Um, but they could interact together. I mean, it didn't matter what side you were on. It wasn't like this crazy sort of a divisive triggering thing where you could, you know, and I, apparently it was sort of tacky or to talk politics, you know, at dinner parties or whatever. You know, not, not that one shouldn't, but you want to be able to have a conversation right. without people literally like losing friends or walking out or losing whatever. Friends. Losing friends. Yeah. Ending relationships. Yeah. yeah. I, like never in my lifetime, I cannot wrap my head around it. And you, like I was saying, all the shitty dysfunction, you know, the world is still right up against World War III yeah. again. And yeah. what's so interesting is I was just talking to Kara Swisher the other day about the situation with Russia, not that I know anything about geopolitics, but I was like, I, I don't feel good about this at all. You right. feel fine? Right. You're not worried? Right. You don't think, just the smallest thing. 
Because you hear about stories like you have in the movies yeah. where Reagan is sitting in the room and they think we're in a nuclear war and yeah, he has to decide. Oh, like this close. Awesome. This so close. Cool. And then you hear the same stories about Kennedy talking to Khrushchev to de-escalate the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. And you've got, you guys are, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you're Thank you. I'll I'm take sorry. it. I'm like, I'm, you, Tell us what we got going on. You're throwing me off here. <laughs> uh, Nancy and, and Ronnie. Ronnie. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like, you and Ronald um, are with Gorbachev de-escalating. Completely, yeah. But, no, now, I, mean, he, I mean, they say he ended the Cold War. I mean, and Nancy, I have to say, it wasn't shown so much in the movie, but she was a big, big part of pushing him to go to Geneva for the peace talks. She And they all, you know, remember how they were all dying, like, one by one by yes. one? She's like, you better go before Gorbachev, you know, kicks the bucket. <laughs> but, uh, but she was very influential in making that happen, too. And she really... Um, and it, it was amazing. I, I, you know, you you see those scenes where they're where they're talking to each other, and they're these sort of enemies, but then they're able to talk and negotiate or figure it out. And that, to me, is like, I mean, that's you know, it's what leadership is about. And you want to be able to trust that whoever's in that position is able to do that and ha has the capability. But diplomacy, it, they, they don't even advocate for that anymore. It's like, well, we don't talk to... to I, I mean, I think you if Kennedy can talk to Khrushchev and Reagan can talk to Gorbachev, somebody better start talking to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I just... I yeah, we don't even talk to each other. No. Like, we can't because we feel like we're going to, you know, there's that feeling of, like, getting canceled or getting... Um, you know, ostracized or people will hate you. And, you know, and, and I, like I said, growing up, I don't remember that during the Reagan years. I don't remember people being that, that, that kind of animosity and that feeling of like, don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear about it. Like, and you don't, and, and that's how we learn. That's how we figure out to be able to think for ourselves, to be able to cipher, decipher, right. is if we only think one way, how are we going to grow as a, as a country, as a nation, as a world? Like, I feel like we have to be able to have dialogue and we have to educate kids. And I, that's one of the things I actually love about the movie about Reagan is that it's an education about our culture during those years mm -hmm. that people don't know about. Even people who lived during those years are like, oh, there's so much I don't know or I don't remember or I'm nostalgic about. But then there's younger people who actually appreciate the movie because they're like, oh, this is what America looked like. This was what was going on there. And there are parallels, but there was also things that that were great. And so, you know, and, and there was controversy and all of those things. And people didn't like Reagan or, you know, and Nancy, as I said. But, but then there was they were able to talk to each other. And I also felt like our country just was in a very different place. And I think it's important for us to remember, I can't, we can't erase our history. And if you can make a movie like that and it be entertaining and it be moving, relationship driven, like we were talking about people yes. like connecting character driven, we don't have those kind of movies. And I think that's why the movie's doing so well. Uh, you know, the audiences it's are all of it. loving it. It's all of it. Because it's triggering a nerve, I think, in our in America, you know, of 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 just, oh my gosh, like people I, I'm astounded and overwhelmed and very surprised the reaction that I'm getting like all across the board from people who are like, I love this movie. And it doesn't and like people, you know, people that I'm really close to that are, you know, would normally be, you know, not, they're not conservatives by any means and liberal Democrats, whatever. And they love the movie because I think they're, they're like, there's so much I don't know. And it's history and it's moving and it's entertaining. And it's, I don't know, people are just it, struck by it. I think it's just hitting an emotional nerve of like people craving it, like craving something like this and wanting to get back there somehow. Oh my God. It, do you ever, and it, you, I was watching this man, Dennis Quaid, but it's so weird because for yeah. me, it's like yeah. you were, you know, because yeah. it's been such a long time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm watching Ronald Reagan, a.k.a. Dennis Quaid, in, in your movie. It's like, well, you know, it's no, there's no money in it for an honest politician. And he genuinely seems like he wants to serve the people. Like he wants to de-escalate. Like he wants to disarm. I don't remember in the past I don't even, I honestly don't recall for decades 
the last politician who wasn't on both sides, it just wasn't on the pay. I mean, they have to take money to get elected. So who knows? It's like, I don't even, I'm like, which billionaire am I voting for? Well, it's 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 also a power, it's like power hungry. It's it's also financial. Yes. But there's, you know, it, what's funny is I didn't even know this. Like, they, they, they have like this really kind of measly salary, but they get, they literally have to pay. Like she said at the, the first month of being there, Nancy says, we got a bill and they have to pay for their groceries and their toothpaste and you know, the like seriously, they got a bill, what? you know, to pay for them living there. Come I mean, on. this wasn't this Seriously? wasn't their home. This they were just the residents for a period of time at that time, but they had to pay bills. And that's something you're just like, I had no idea that that was the case. I hope that didn't have to the electric bill. <laughs> I don't know, but I know they had to pay for their for their toiletries and their groceries and their you know, foods. And, and, and unless it was a state dinner, you know, unless it was for some big function, they, they had to pay with the money, the salary that he's given. So really, in all honesty, because like, you know, a lot of these politicians, you know, write a book and then they make millions of oh dollars. God, so they get the some speaking book thing and then the speaking engagements. They misappropriated didn't, campaign they didn't, contributions. They didn't do that. And, they didn't do that. But Even their tell. house that they was, you go, oh, it's Bel Air. They lived in Bel Air after. It was a very modest home. It was like three bedrooms, one story. They didn't live a lavish lifestyle. She wore designer gowns because they were they were borrowed. Right. 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 But and she loved fashion. But she wasn't even when she got maligned for um redecorating the White House when she first moved in, she said it was in a shambles. It was like tattered curtains and carpets and the plumbing, the electricity and everything just looked like it was just, and she said, this is the people's home. You know, we have dignitaries and politicians and presidents coming into our home. Like their first dinner was with like Margaret Thatcher. Yes. And she was like kind of embarrassed because she was like, I want, I want people to come into our home and be like, this is America's home, right? We want to be proud. Right. So, and she didn't even use taxpayer money. She used um, privately funded money to, to, to redecorate the White House, but she got completely vilified. She did the same thing with the China because the Margaret Thatcher dinner, they said there was, there was some sort of like catty remark about how it was all mismatched China. Well, it was mismatched because they never, the complete set either had, there had been broken plates or dishes or chipped or people had stolen them to take a little Bit of memorabilia. Yes, they'd probably take a little bread plate or whatever. You know, I got a memorabilia from the White House. I mean, so they had. So, so she, so she got this. There was this all this controversy about the red china because she, she had this whole new china set made, and it was expensive. But once again, privately funded money because she wanted to have people come and have a full set of china. So it was silly things like that. Mary Todd Lincoln, who I played you know, had very similar issues. Like I told you, they loved Abe Lincoln, didn't like her because she loved her fashion. She was getting fine silks from, you know, she wanted to dress. She was kind of like into the royalty of it all. And she liked, she said, I should dress like a first lady, you know, so. You she, know, she didn't though. If she didn't, it would be like, she's a schlump. Yes. She's homely. Yeah, she's a hag, she's whatever. A, yes. Yeah. And, and so, women cannot win. And then, right. So they can't. You can't win. You can't, and, and, and she did the same thing. She redecorated the White House, got the same attack because it was Civil War. It was Depression. There was, you know, why is she doing this? But she felt the same way. She's the one who, for, the first woman who opened up the White House for public touring. Really? Yeah. So... She, you know, so she too was maligned and she lost three boys, horrific deaths, watched them die, terrible, I mean, awful. Then she had once another son who completely was estranged from her at the end for some reason. She had melancholy because she lost all these, she, went, she lost all these children. She, she, she had seances because that was her way of dealing with her grief. Oh my gosh. Whereas Nancy went into astrology. There's a lot of parallels between those two. But the interesting thing I realized was the white, the first lady uh, who didn't get vilified, who was beloved and almost could do no wrong was Michelle. Jack Jacqueline Kennedy. Well, there was Michelle too, but Jackie Kennedy. Because Jackie Kennedy did the fashion, redecorated the White House, the whole thing. She did the same thing, but it was the Camelot years. It was Camelot and she was so beautiful and everyone loved her and they loved, you know, Ken, I, it was, I don't know why, but I look at that too. I look at the two, you know, the two women, Mary and, and Nancy, and then I see like, well, why was Jacqueline Kennedy like, you know, just, she was like, do you think it's because 
she was beautiful. But was she, I don't know, more of a wallflower? Because Nancy was involved. You knew she was involved. Mm, yeah. She decided whether or not he wore a coat to meet with yes. Gorbachev. It's like, you're going to wear this. Yeah. And the place is going to look like this. Yeah. And these guys are out for you. And I'm going, like, yeah. she was a t- tough was. bitch. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. The, and, and, she was a badass. She was a bad. Yeah. yeah she was a badass. You, know, you, I forgot. Yeah. I don't know. Your I, I portrayal, she, I, did, I remember. I, mean, I mean, Jacqueline Kennedy came off a little bit more because the way she talked and she had yeah, this demure. very whisper, very demure, sort of more submissive. like Less you know, intimidating. You know, perhaps. You know, I don't know why they didn't like Mary Todd. I... I don't. I don't know. I mean, I guess it was those things that they just thought she was a spendthrift and didn't care about the country or something. But she was very much involved in the abolitionist movement, and even her seamstress who made her dresses, who was a black woman, got into this 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 uh, foundation with her. You know, of of, uh, and she was help. They were helping during that time with slavery and freeing the slaves and everything and getting them jobs. That was the whole point of her doing this with this seamstress was to help women of color get work. And she was not about, I mean, I, so fun doing research. Honestly, like one of the reasons I like playing real characters is I get to delve into like so much, like especially historical characters like that. I get to learn, I get to learn so much and humanize them, you know? You are humanizing. I, cause I kind of do remember as a kid, you, you, we did eight years with them, like you said, and because I was trying to think back, like I remember being t- young, ten yeah. ish, I think, mm-hmm. maybe can't recall exactly when his presidency started. Because I remember it was eighty one. Was it eighty one? Was it eighty one? Was it was eighty four? Somewhere in the early eighties. No, because that was his second term. Because he went, he left at I think eighty eight or eighty nine. Okay, so, so eighty nine. I would have been fifteen. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was when he left. So then right. we have to think of those eight years, whatever that was. Between. I remember as a kid being so, so... That's when I moved to York, too. Oh, no, 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 I didn't move to York then. All right, go ahead. Well, no. Um, um, 84, I moved to York. But I think I, I was, like, ideologically captured as a child because I grew up here, so I just was like, well, we're Democrats. And I was like seven or eight. Oh, yeah, I was, was thinking how insane same. Yeah. that I would have had an opinion. I knew nothing right. about what was going on at all. Nothing. nothing. Me neither. And Zero. you know, you kind of follow your parents. You're like, yes. well, this is how my parents feel. So parents I feel. I'm a Democrat, yeah. Yeah. so we're all Democrats. Yeah. But I knew nothing about politics. Yeah. And for some reason, I remember just thinking, like, I don't, I don't like them. Because they yeah. were, uh, which is just fucking. Yeah. yeah. No. I, 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 it's, I, like, that I, was I, the feeling. I sat with the kids at the table last night. Because I'd started the movie and then we ate something. I was going back to, I'm like, I should make you guys watch this with me. Because my son's on YouTube and God yeah, knows yeah, my yeah, kids I watching. And I started to tell them, I'm like, I remember, I was your age, P, you know, yeah. when. And I try to get, like, <laughs> like, just, you don't need to be political. You're children. Right, don't just, be political. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wait until like, you're older. Right. Listen to everybody. Form your own yes. opinions. Don't fall into yes, this. Yes. It's a dangerous yeah. game. Yeah. And wanting to expose them to different points of right. view, but even in the movie. And getting them to think for themselves. Yes. Not doing it just because it's the popular thought. Yes. Or because, you know, the school is this way and that way. Like really getting them to say, let me form my own opinion so I let me get the information so I can form my own opinion. Yes. And and ask questions. Like my younger daughter, like constantly asks me questions and here she was she's 15 she was at the premiere and I didn't know how she'd feel about the movie you know because it's not a political movie really it's yeah, a god it's forbid a, you play a Republican but, but I but I'm you know uh you know, it's a, it's a, it's a biopic. It's what it is. But she really liked it, and she, she said, you know, she'll totally think she said it was a little long, but I liked it. You know, <laughs> so I thought that's honest. You know, but she liked it. And to, for a fifteen-year-old to sit through a movie like that, oh no, forget it. Like, they don't me, have the attention span anymore. Yeah, I, and I know people who said I took my eleven-year-old, I took my, I took my kid. They really liked the movie. I'm like, wow. Okay. You feel compelled so that's when you're watching it. Healing you, to you're younger like they people. need to watch it. They need to watch it Be- because of the parts. Like all my notes, I have all the personal stuff. You know, like the honest politician stuff. They sat with enemies. They worked across the aisle. Like right. these are the things. He was so considered the great communicator. I mean, admittedly, politics aside, I thought Obama was a great communicator. But you know, people like him, don't like him. 
I, I did feel he communicated. I understood when he spoke, at least. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, I just fuck. It. I just don't. I don't trust right. either side. I don't. I. I can't stand that they don't get along. It feels like a bad divorce all the time. <laughs> What's funny, you look at the debates between Reagan and Mondale or Reagan and Carter and whatever, and they're kind of like laughing and joking yes. with each other too. Like he, they even laughed at that line that gets that got a huge laugh so that I think kind of won him the presidency when he says, I will not make age or inexperience a topic of this. against you. Yeah, I'm going to hold it against you. And it was perfect because they were talking about his age, which he was in his late 70s at the time. Now it's like, you know, we're in, we're in what, 80s, late 80s. I mean, obviously not Kamala, but, but then when it was Biden. But, like, you know, and they were worrying about Reagan's age, right. you know, which was interesting. But I love that he just turned it around and made it about uh, made it about his youth and experience. I just think it was hysterical. And he laughed. Mondale laughed. Yes, I, you guys put that footage in, and yeah. I was like, "That's Mondale." I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It was just so wild. What would you like to see? What would you like to see people take away from this? Oh gosh. Well, I just I think. I, I, I mean, hopefully that they'll, you know, they'll learn something. Hopefully they'll be entertained. Um, oh, it's entertaining. It is entertaining. Very. And, and I think, and, and not only that, I just feel like, you know, and Dennis says this a lot, but it's like, you know, to see what America was and that it can be that again. And I think that that would be, you know, even the world actually, but I do feel like as far as America, because I feel like we sort of set an example of sorts because we're we're a free country, so and so yeah, hopefully exactly. That's one like, one generation like one, away. That's a note so that I made. You're one generation away from losing your freedom. That's right, and that's, that's why still kids. True. That's why kids. It's so important that kids pay attention and not follow along and be sheep. Like I just feel like it's so important that they they really do. You know look at all sides and see both sides. And that's the problem is people aren't seeing both sides. Nope. And that, you can't do no. that and have a very, a, 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 an informed decision. No. You just can't. No. And then you are, you're you're just a sheep going along with like what you're supposed to go along with. Like go along, get along, you know, whatever. Don't, we'll, we'll just take that person's word for it. Why? Why don't you do your research? Why don't you look into this? It's like with everything, you know? Um, I just, you know, and and being able to have a dialogue, connecting with people, communicating. I just hope that people, I think that's why this movie has resonated with audiences so greatly is because it's a reminder of, 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 of like I said, of what we had and what we can still have if we can just, if we can just put all that aside, egos, you know, crazy emotions, anger, and just say, hey, you know, let's get back to, talking to each other, having a dialogue, um, and, and I guess, you know, loving, I mean, you know, I say loving our country. I don't, I, I love our country. I think everybody, yeah. I, I, mean, I miss that. I never even realized that I, like, listen, I, I did a USO tour years ago and I always understood what it meant, you know, one percent of our country is like in the military, and they they fight these fights, whether they're noble or because you know Dick Cheney and Halliburton. Nevertheless, I have nothing but crazy respect for the military. Yeah, I'm, I adopted a kid from another country because it's like, well, okay, I could take a kid from foster care, which is you know, yeah, but at the same time, like at least that child's in America. There's hope. Mm -hmm. Whereas a child in the developing world, like Haiti, no shot. Mm -hmm. There's no shot. Mm -hmm. It will probably die of cholera, which right. exists over there. And right. God knows what, a bacterial infection right. could kill a child there. Right. Forget it. They're going to get raped. They're going to get sold into the sex trade across the border. Okay. And so I wanted to say, I've got, I, I get a free pass right. and I get to use it. Right. And I'm using it for this kid on top of wanting a kid. But that's why another country... And I never realized how much I truly appreciated our country mm -hmm. and what a gift we had yeah. being born here until people started shitting on it. Yeah. Like screaming death to America. And burning flags. Get the flags. fuck I out of here. Get out. I'm like, don't burn a flag. Right? I don't it's, get it either. I don't. It's, like, don't, yeah, don't live here. Get don't live the here. fuck 
yeah. out of here. Yeah. How did you get in here? Which is well, amazing. You think I work for the United Nations well, Refugee Agency, dude. Well, this I mean, is, it's like if you think about our forefathers and that constitution and how brilliant it is and how they thought of everything because they knew where they'd come from. And, and you know, and people that are fighting to get in here are just coming here. Um, you know, they, 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 there's a reason that they're coming here and want to live here. Yes. And, and there's a reason that this constitution and these people who literally died to save our country, to, to make it a free country, to make everything freedom of speech, you know, free, like they, they really, they were brilliant minds and they were young men. Yeah. But I just think like we can't, we, we can't forget that. That's why, you know, we are who we are and we need to, we need to stand up for who we are. And we need to believe and have, and have some sense of hope. I mean, if anything, like back to your question of what do I hope that this movie will do for, I hope it will give us hope and faith in ourselves, because it's about us. It's on ourselves, in our country, in our worth, in our value, in our, you know, all of those things that are just so important to us. Also just living in a peaceful world, being happy, being content, you know, thriving, all of those things. And we need that so desperately. And, um, and I think that's why people, I, I hear stories of people at the end of the movie just sobbing their eyes out and, and, and just, just, getting up in the middle of a theater, not because the stars are there or anything, and giving it a standing ovation and applauding. And I'm like, wow. Like, I've heard that on my social media page. I can't tell you how many times like, people have said when I've been reading, like, people's reactions to seeing the film of how emotionally affected they are. Because of how fucked the world is. It is everything you said. It, it just it, it makes you so desperate to go back to this better time where we were better to each other. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember driving around, uh, riding around on my bicycle. We never locked our doors. We rode around. We didn't have, we were paranoid and scared, you know, scared of the like gang members coming, you know, into our, you know, Venezuelan gang members. I mean, like, like in na nice neighborhoods. Happening. Uh, this one story, and uh, like, I'll leave this at your doorstep because th this is just kind of the hoping to get back to what you're talking about where we're communicating with each other. My wife's a Republican. I'm independent, was Democrat, now mm -hmm. sit pretty much in the middle and, yeah. and have very pe people close to me on both sides. Yeah. I, I really do think I hear the things they worry about and the things they care about, and I understand it. I just wish they would talk for this reason. So over the weekend, um, my wife goes to this flea market that we have uh, that uh, happens in uh, Los Angeles. And she loves nostalgia. Yeah. Um, so this woman has Nazi nostalgia. She's like, oh, yeah, it's a, so there's a big market for it. Hold on. And my wife's like, I've, I've heard that, you know. And she goes, I wonder one day if, you know, when you look at Trump memorabilia, it'll be like the Nazi stuff. And my wife didn't say anything. She comes home and she's like, they really think we're Nazis, honey. And I was like, I didn't know what to say because I wow. think, I think, people do. And when you feel that a person who's a Republican is a Nazi, yeah. you've either lost your mind, yeah. know nothing about Hitler, or have been totally brainwashed. brainwashed. Yeah. And I, I, I just think that's why your, your movie is so special because it, yeah, like you said, it does remind us of, of what we can be and who we are, mm -hmm. um, and and rising up to that yeah. better part of yeah. ourselves. Yeah, and you're brave as shit for doing it. Did oh, you know that at the you. time? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really. I thought it was like a cool acting thing, and I have to say, I've had cool so much. I've, I, I had so much support, and of course, you know, it was four years ago. It was a different time, but it's still, you know, it still wasn't great. But I think, uh, you know, like everybody who signed on, I really don't think they weren't doing it for political reasons. We did it because we thought this is a story that needed to be told and hadn't been told. And, you know, why not? Let's do it. I, I, so I, I think as interestingly enough that everything happened with the SAG strike and with the writer strike and with COVID and everything that the movie took this long to come out. Oh, yes, and everyone's yeah. like, oh, it's coming out during election year. So we have an agenda. And I'm like, 
it just, we didn't have an agenda at all. But there was a lot of people who, who would like to think that, but that's not the case. It's just happening to come out at a time that maybe we just need it. We need it to come out now. And that was, to me, divine intervention because it was not planned. Like we thought maybe a year later it would come out. And in a way, I'm glad it didn't because people still were like isolating and not going to the theater and whatnot. Right, um, of course. But I think people also like going to the theater and I hope that that will come back more. And and there were pe- I've had people say to me, I haven't been to the theater in years. Wouldn't go for anything going out to see this movie going to the theater for the first time, like, in years. My mom, yeah. Yeah. My mom's There's like, oh, you loved it? I'm like, I loved it. You have to go see it. Yeah. And, and like, see, oh. I know you didn't see it in that capacity, but there's something Only because about- I only had two no, days to see it. I understand. Like, I forgive <laughs> I you. I was going. I forgive you. But literally, but- that they're like, we can- Penelope I. Miller, we're talking to you. I was like, yeah, I want to talk to her. Oh, so I well, got- thank, thank you for doing I your totally, homework. Like, are you thank kidding? Because it's so hard talking- to talk to people that well, I haven't seen it. But, but I also think having that experience in a movie theater with other people with you and feeling the emotion, you know, the humor too and the emotion and all of that. And I just think there's something- that I think is great about it because it's, it is a community. Like, you know, it makes you feel like you're part of, you're experiencing something with people. And I think we need to do more of that. Um, so I love that it is in the theaters because everyone's like, oh, so when's your movie Reagan come? Where is, it, where is it streaming? You know, and I was like, uh, well, it's not streaming. It's actually, good. where? I mean, in theater, in theater, movie theaters? I'm like, yes, they're still out there. There are movie theaters where you can get popcorn, buy a ticket, sit in your chair. You know, I'm like, everyone just assumes that, you know, because they so much has gone to the streaming world. But I'm so glad because our producers so want, badly wanted this. They wanted it to be in a theater. They wanted it to be an experience. And I, and I, and I'm so grateful that they persevered as much as they did to make sure that was going to happen and to get the right distribution company that also believed in it, that could get it out there. Um, because, you know, there is a side of, of, you know, Hollywood that doesn't want, maybe want our movie to succeed. And um, that's why there's this disparity between the critics and the and the audiences, because we have the most disparity between that with the 98% approval rating. It, you know, it's like, to me, the people have spoken. To me, the audiences are telling us they love the movie. Because in a cinema score of A, I mean, you you, you can't manufacture that, you know, so it just leads me to hopefully get other people or makes uh, hopefully other people realize you can't necessarily pay it. Like, think for yourself. Look at what the people are saying. You don't need to go because somebody's saying, like, it's just trash or whatever. Are you serious? Oh, we've had, yeah, we've had some crazy ones. I don't want people, I don't, I don't want to. Yeah, but wanna... here's, the, I'll tell you the interesting thing about the right that I r- really appreciate is they, if they see a bad review, they'll no. <laughs> well, they say. It, and they'll go and then bring their whole family. Well, they say if they it's love like, to hate, it must be great. It's That's just what they're I, saying. I think now people see through Hopefully. all of this agenda. Yeah. At least those of us who are a little older mm. know better, you know. Um, you know, it's like, what's the source nowadays? What, you have to question everything. Yeah, it's you ridiculous. can't believe everything you read, and it, you can't believe everything. Yeah, sends me articles on new, from Newsweek. I'm like, mom, that's just that's not true. She's like, oh, you're telling me Newsweek isn't. My like, dad I, was the same way. He believed everything. Like if it, if he saw it on the news, yep. he would believe it because that generation. Yes, you know, my dad not died. Oh my God, today's the anniversary of his death two years ago. Just realized that. Oh my God. I mean, I didn't just, I knew it earlier, but it just reminded me. But he was the kind of person who, because, you know, he was born in the 20s and wow. he believed in, you know, like if this is what they're telling me, if the news is telling me that they're honorable and they're telling me the truth. And, and that's, that was because of how he grew up and how he was raised. He didn't believe, like, why would they lie to me? Do you know, Reagan changed that law. I don't know if you know this one because that one wasn't in the movie, but the fact that he, the vaccine thing, I saw you guys put yeah. that in there, that he gave immunity to the va- to pharmaceutical companies yeah. for vaccines. Uh, I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, he, hold my breath. No, yeah. No, he didn't. There's things that he, he didn't do. He signed the bill from Congress, right? Yeah. I, but, but the here's the one thing. Wasn't there a bill that he signed that gave journalists permission to insert opinions, I thought? 
Because previously, I thought it was illegal or there's something where they, it had to just be just the facts. Right, right, right. And I thought- And then there could be an opinion side of it, another- I guess he had some, uh, something, a law passed during his administration that changed the ability, I guess, to give opinions. I'm speaking out of my ass here. Do, do, do your own on it. Um, but I feel like I remember that. And it definitely became, you're like watching two different, you've got the Rachel Maddow's world and Tucker Carlson's world. Mm -hmm. You're like, <laughs> right. Yeah, we're they're operating what completely different. Am I on? They're, they're, they're in an alternate universe <laughs> yes. for sure. You um, have to just like, you really. Well, and there's things. Look, there's things that Reagan, uh, you know, he didn't acknowledge the the AIDS epidemic early enough. I know he got criticized for that. Um, and and in her book, in Nancy's book, you know, she talks about Rock Hudson and how they were very close with Rock Hudson. Didn't realize he was gay. He hid the fact that he had AIDS, and then when they found out, you know, but they loved him. I mean, they were just, you know, it, it, they were so upset that they didn't know and that they weren't there for him. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, AIDS, whoa, you know, but it was sort of like, maybe we need to, we, there's something going on here that they we need to really, them. yeah. So sometimes when it touches you deep, like personally, yep. which is unfortunate, it shouldn't always be that, right? It is, even for me, and you know, who I like to think I really pay attention. Something hits home, that's going to wake you up. For sure. Well, that's, that's you know, what's happening, I think. I mean, to people that aren't completely like, mm -hmm. you know, horses with blinders yes. on. But uh, but that's that's true. And hopefully the movie, too, will be eye-opening in that, in that regard as well. Let's talk about your past for a second here. You've, you've worked with everybody. Al Pacino, De Niro, now Dennis Quaid. I mean, your career is... Brando. Don't forget Brando. <laughs> We can't leave him out. <laughs> right, we can't leave out Brando. We can't leave out Brando. I that mean, was a lucky break for me, for sure. So let's start. Like, let's start with you're a kid. You want to be an actress. Did everybody say good luck? Um, well, I mean, I, I would have been like, you know, really talk good luck, honey. I, let's, you know, I grew up in LA, so obviously, you know, there's the stigma attached with people who either live in LA or are in LA. You know, might as you know, it's like, oh, are you going into acting? Like, and 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 for me. It was even maybe more so because my dad was an actor. So we were exposed to it, at, obviously, you know, yeah. from when we were you know, yeah. <laughs> conceived. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was around us. And um, I kind of struggled a little bit in school. Um, so I didn't get into, you know, the big colleges. And so I was going to this junior college that had no drama department. And I was... Oh my gosh, I'm kind of revealing too much. But I was on social and academic probation. And my dad, like, my dad flew out. I was in Palo Alto near Stanford, but not at Stanford. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, um, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I'm kind of lost. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to act. That's what I've always wanted to do. He said, well, then why aren't you? Why aren't you? You're not even at a school that has a drama department. Wow. So then I decided I'm going to move to New York. This is kind of a wild story, but my godfather was really good friends with Leonard Bernstein. His son, Alexander, was going to a school called HB Studios. He told me to come down. We were visiting New York, staying. <laughs> this sounds so crazy. We were staying at Leonard Bernstein's house in the Dakota. He said, come and visit. The Dakota. Yes. Where Lennon, where Lennon was, was shot. shot. How old are you at this time? Um, I was probably 19. So, or 18, 18. And um, he said, come and check out my acting class. So I did. I audited one of his classes. And he says, why are you trying to go to these colleges? Come to acting class here. This is Alexander Bernstein. Um, or Bernstein, now I'm probably saying it wrong. But um, Canceled again. I know. Gosh. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's what I did. I ended up going to school, uh, acting school. And once I moved to New York, Within that year, I got a Broadway play. I just got really lucky. And everything, like, once I got that Broadway show, which was Biloxi Blues, which was a Neil Simon play, which was part of the trilogy with Matthew Broderick, which, you know, he did Brighton Beach. He was becoming a big movie star for more games. Left it, our show to do Ferris Bueller. But I, it, we toured in L.A. We opened in L.A. at Dalmanson. Then we went to San Francisco at the Current Theater. 
and then ended up on Broadway. We won the Tony. That opened so many doors for me. Um, and then one thing led to another, and I started doing movies. And then I luckily got to do the movie of Biloxi Blues, which none of the original cast besides Matthew and one other actor were, were from the original production. I had to audition all over again because Mike Nichols was directing it and wanted kind of a new, fresh cast. I got so lucky in that regard because I got that role, and uh, they could have easily gone to anyone else but um so that was a big break and um yeah i mean okay so three notes i have okay. sorry okay. i'm like oh, no I, 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 I really you had me go down this no i lane. love it i was trying to do the cliff note version no i well i have a lot of notes off of your your cliff note version the, the first question actually is the conversation you had with your dad struck me because i mean i don't know how many parents would handle it that way it's like well what do you want to do well, let me encourage you to do what you want to do. Instead of acting, right? Instead of coming from that parent place of being afraid, where mm. you're like, oh, no, no, you need to do what you should do. And you, you should do this. This is safe and this is secure. Right, right. Do you think that was a pivotal moment? Do you think he could have pushed you in the wrong direction? Had he said to go back to school? Or? Well, the one thing I really appreciated about both my mom and dad was that they really believed you should follow your passion. And if you follow your passion and you 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 strive to do what you love to do, hopefully you will succeed at that. You just have to believe in yourself. And I hope I can instill that in my kids as well, in all kids. But uh, because a lot of times we we get scared, we get scared we will fail. And this business is super hard to get into. Plus, there's so much rejection. Um, and and my dad knew that. But he also said, if that's, if, if it's, you know, it's that follow your bliss thing, follow your passion. And so they supported me and they, they knew, you know, it was going to be, I was either going to make it or not make it, but they, they figured why not try to do that rather than doing, like you said, the safe thing or the thing that, you know, you, once you get that job, you don't necessarily lose it. It's like with an acting job, you're done once the show's over, the right. movie's over and, and then no you're, stability. and then you don't know when your next job is coming. So you're constantly trying to get the next job and the next job and the next job. And then here I am, I'm 60. And the fact that I have, uh, that I'm still working and, and playing a role like Nancy Reagan, I, I mean, my... <laughs> oh my gosh, like, I can't even believe it. I hope you said, okay, so you said it surprisingly, I got into, you know, this acting school and I got lucky that Mike Nichols cast me and that I got lucky you don't have a 42-year career from luck. So do you think for exceptional people who accomplish exceptional things, is it part talent, part 10,000-hour rule? Do you think is somebody born without the ability to do it could learn it? Like, what's the secret sauce to 42 years of... Yeah, I mean, you like, know, obviously, you. I think talent obviously helps for sure. Right. There's no doubt. Um, I, I had an, had a situation that happened in my acting class. Um, not in my class, but I tried to audition for Uta Hagen, who was married to Herbert Berghoff. And her class was the premier class to get in. And that was what everybody strived to get in. And it was sort of the elite of the drama school to be in that class. And I auditioned for that, not I didn't audition for her because you had to get through her panel first. Didn't make it through the panel. And I I really w I had that moment of doubting myself of thinking maybe maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe I'm not good. M maybe maybe I won't make it. Like it really rattled me because all the people that I was friends with that I was in Herbert's class with were in Uda's class. Wow. And then I didn't get in. And so it really made me question everything. And I was living in New York, living in this teeny little studio apartment, working as a hostess at Tavern on the Green. I mean, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, what's my life going to look like? And so what I thought to myself was, well, you know, this is, this is maybe a sign that I either quit or it's a kick in the pants and it'll make me work harder to strive to be better. And so I thought, okay, I'm not in Nuda's class, but I'm in Herbert's class, so I'm going to work harder. I'm going to actually take this really seriously and not rely on just maybe natural ability or whatever. Like, I really want to be good. And um, 
and it really turned things around for me in terms of my confidence and even though it could have completely knocked me say, yeah, out. You could go both ways. Both ways. How has the industry changed um, from when, besides this piece, do you think it's gotten a better or worse with regard to all the kind of Harvey Weinsteins of the world? Do you think that shit still goes on? Well, I think it always went on. I mean, I think it was going on, you know, Fatty Arbuckle and all that way, way back in the 20s. I mean, you know, even Charlie Chaplin was no saint, even, right. even though I was in Chaplin. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, he married like a 16-year-old. I mean, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it, it just Jesus. was either accepted in a different way or it was brushed under the rug or there were people protected, whatever. I mean, I just feel like. I got spared that, to be I honest. Did too. I too. I often think of Everyone like, oh, always is like, wait, but I had two movies that Harvey uh, um, Weinstein um, distributed. Um, and they were like, and, and it was really like the women are, that were in my generation were a lot of them that were definitely blacklisted and and had those those problems um, with Blacklisted. Him. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't... And I, I never had had that casting couch, you know, situation where somebody was making lewd advancements uh, towards me. And I thought, well, maybe I'm not their type or I don't know. I'm like, like, okay, I mean, look, I'm glad, I'm glad. (laughs) But, you know, my manager at the time is a woman. She was with me a lot. She was around me a lot because I think she knew it was prevalent. And I think it was a way to protect me. Yeah, for sure. By keeping me away. But I also feel like I don't know if, like, I'd be like, can you come and meet with me in my hotel room? I'd probably be like, (laughs) you know, but, you know, not. and look, I... You know, I feel so horribly for these women who are victims of of that, um, because you know, you think that people are innately, you know, decent, and you you think they want to help you, and they have other other ideas in mind. So, I just uh, I got I got spared, thankfully. Yeah, you're awesome. Thank you so much for doing Thank this. You. Thank you for having me. I, I really enjoyed the this. movie. Yeah. And I have loved all of your movies and been a huge fan, even though I I know nothing about acting. You have entertained me and educated me for decades. And I am grateful for it. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed uh, meeting you too. And uh, I'm glad you're doing this. I think it's awesome. And, you know, thank you for for loving our movie and hopefully getting more people to go out and see it. And I know people who said, I'm going to go see it again, you know, and then... Bring, bring my, to bring the my family. family. That's the thing. Yeah. It's like the mom, yeah. I got my mom and the kids. Yeah. And you want yeah. people to like, wake up, Experience wake up, it. Yeah. wake up, yeah. wake up. And we need to do it because, you know, we're, we need, we need help from the people. We need them to put the word out because the word of mouth is what's getting people to go. A hundred percent. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the podcast, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. And make sure to let me know what guests you want to see on in the future.